It is now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Ontario families are working harder, paying more, and getting less. But this summer, Hydro One applied for yet another rate increase, wow. a rate increase that could cost families, Ontario families, $141 more per year. Mr. Speaker, will the, pre will, will the Premier promise to stop yet another rate hike? Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I want to start by welcoming all members back to the Legislature. Uh, I know I know how hard everyone works over the summer in their constituencies, and I want just to acknowledge that and to welcome everyone back to do this part of our job in the, in the Legislature. And Mr. Speaker, uh, I know that uh, the member opposite is very aware that people across the province saw a 25 percent reduction in their electricity bills this summer, Mr. Speaker. And he knows, as we do, that that makes, that makes it uh, much fairer for people across the province, particularly people in rural and remote areas, uh, who saw up to a 40 to 50 percent reduction, Mr. Here, Speaker. Here. The, reality is, the reality is, Mr. Speaker, that uh, we Answer. are facing many challenges in this province, and we have a responsible and a fair plan to address those. Thank the you. Fair Hydro Plan is part of that. Mr. Supplementary. And isn't working. Mr. Speaker. I asked the Premier a question about the proposed Hydro One rate hike, which is entirely in the government's power to stop. They've had 100-plus ministerial directives where they've been able to interfere and meddle in the energy wow. market in Ontario. Now there's a rate increase, $141, that Ontario families can't pay, and the Premier's saying nothing. The Premier's not going to stop it. So I will ask again, will the Premier do the right thing and stop this hydro Here. rate hike? Excellent. Mr. Speaker, I had the privilege of traveling the province this summer, and uh, all over the province, I was talking to folks and hearing from them about changes that we're making. Mr. Speaker, there are more than 180,000 young people in post-secondary today paying zero tuition because of the tuition, uh, the um, uh, because of the uh, OSAP changes that we made, Mr. Speaker. We have. People in this province who have seen $200, $300 reductions on their electricity bills, Mr. Speaker, because of our fair hydro plan. Across the province, residents have seen at least a 25 percent, 23 to 25 percent reduction on their electricity bills, Mr. Speaker. So we recognize that there are challenges that people are confronting. That's exactly why we have a fair hydro plan. That's exactly why we have reduced tuition and made it free for young people across the province, Mr. Mr. Speaker, those, Thank you. those are the results that we're seeing. Thank you. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, I asked a question about the hydro rate hike, and the Premier starts talking about tuition. Just for once, it would be nice if the Premier answered the serious concerns that Ontario families have. So here we have a $141 hydro rate hike at a time when the government promised relief. And what's unbelievable and disappointing is that at the time they're trying to grab more money for Hydro, Hydro One's about to pay $6.7 billion for an American energy company, and the Avista CEO said this allows them to spread the cost burden out. Spread the cost burden out? Does that mean Ontario ratepayers yep. would be subsidizing ratepayers in Washington exactly. and Montana? Oh, so maybe exactly. for a third time, maybe the Premier can say yes or no. Is she going to block that hydro rate hike? Thank you. You see that, please? You see that, please? Thank you. Start the clock. So, as I said, Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the leader of the opposition knows that uh, people have seen reductions on their electricity bills. He also knows that rate hikes are being held at inflation for the next four years, Mr. Speaker. Well, I guess they will. The member from Leeds Grand will come to order. And the others. 
Mr. Speaker, the Fair Hydro Plan put in place a, an average 25 percent reduction for people across the province and for four years hold any increases at inflation. So, Mr. Speaker, I would say to the uh, Leader of the Opposition, who has not brought forward a plan in any way, Mr. Speaker, to deal with electricity prices, um, that this is a fair plan and it helps people across the province. Mr. Speaker, I would also say to the Leader of the Opposition that on top of that, we have got in place programs to help people who are living on low income, Mr. Speaker. And he knows that in northern and rural communities, people are seeing a 40 to 50 percent reduction, Mr. Speaker. Okay. That's making a difference. New question. The Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. And I had a hope that I would have gotten a response on the hydro rate hike. Instead, I have the Premier say they tie it to inflation. It's gone up 300 per cent on their watch, and that's tied to inflation. Wow. Well, they don't want to talk about that. Let me try something else. Mr. Speaker, to the Premier, yes or no? Does the Premier support her government's decision to give a $4.9 million grant to the billion dollar maker of the deadly drug OxyContin? Premier. Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Mr. Speaker, I'm trying to think of the best way to say within the rules of parliamentary procedure that the member is completely all wet with that question, Mr. Speaker. That's the best way I can put it. We, uh, th this government has never given any grant to any company that I'm aware of that, 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 that uh, would be going towards the, uh, the uh, development or the uh, establishment or the building of uh, OxyContin. We do, Mr. Speaker, invest in research and development, and that's one of the reasons, Mr. Speaker, in this province why we have an unemployment rate at 5.7 per cent, lowest unemployment rate we've seen in 16 years, because we make investments in R&D, Mr. Speaker. We make investments in our bioscience sector. We make investments in ICT, Mr. Speaker, and we're going to yes, continue sir. to make those investments. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, uh, again to the Premier, that was uh, a pretty weak response, and probably why the Premier didn't want to respond herself. Mr. Speaker, an internal government document from 2008 read, and I quote, Purdue Pharma Canada has been named in three class action lawsuits across Canada over the last year or so in connection with the OxyContin line of painkillers. The note mentioned the company settled a $600 million settlement in the United States connected to OxyContin. But this government went ahead with the grant and then tried to hide the deal from the public. Uh, this is their words. This is a government hey, document. Hey. Mr. Speaker, can the Premier herself truly justify funding a company that is partially responsible for the opioid crisis Ontario currently facing? And please don't pass it off. This is a very yeah, important yeah. issue to Ontario families. Thank you, Minister. Mr. Speaker, let me be very, very clear. This grant went toward the construction of a 26,000 square foot expansion to produce manufacturing facility in Pickering. This funding supported a doubling of their R&D capacity in Ontario. The agreement specifically stated that Ontario's funding would not be used. Oh. The member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke come to order. Please finish. The leader was being straight up, Mr. Speaker. He would know that this agreement specifically stated that Ontario's funding could not be used directly or indirectly for any work related to the Oxycontin line of drugs. Mr. Speaker, he's mixing and matching the investments that we make in research and development that that party has always opposed, Mr. Speaker, are contributing Answer. to the fact that we're leading the G7 in growth. We're going to continue to make those investments in our research and innovation ecosystem, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Final supplementary. 
Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, this Liberal shell game uh, at work again. No matter what the money was earmarked for in the grant, the money was given to the maker of OxyContin, the drug responsible for countless addictions, overdoses and deaths, the drug that was the gateway to the opioid crisis in Ontario. Saying otherwise is just like telling the people of Ontario that the, that the Liberals gave money to a cigarette company, but the company isn't using the money to sell cigarettes. Their logic does not work. There are no ifs and buts about it. The Liberals fund the production and distribution of OxyContin Minister through this grant program, sport. and it is unacceptable. The money, the money, Mr. Stop the clock. In case he didn't hear it, the Minister of Agriculture was uh, asked to come to order. The Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport was asked to come to order, and I'm now asking the Minister of Economic Development to come to order. I know how to play the game. I haven't forgotten. And I'll ramp it up if you want me to. Please finish. Mr. Speaker, the government's own internal documents warned them what was going to happen. So my question is very direct, Mr. Speaker. Once again, to the Premier, question. will the Premier apologize for her government's decision to fund the maker of OxyContin, knowing full well its contribution to the opioid crisis Thank in you. Ontario? Thank you. To the Minister of Health, Mr. Speaker. Health long-term care. Well, Mr. Speaker, I am absolutely shocked that the Leader of the Opposition – I'm shocked because he knows, he knows well, and this has been in the public domain, that that grant had absolutely nothing to do with OxyContin. And in you fact, Mr. Apologize. Speaker, his party is entirely devoid of ideas, ideas that I've welcomed for more than a year because we have a public health crisis on the opioid crisis right now, and he takes his time to fabric to, to illustrate a story, to, to try and make a connection that he full well he well knows there is no connection to be made. Mr. Speaker, we have invested almost $300 million in the opioid crisis. The Premier two weeks ago met with a dozen frontline harm reduction workers. I met with that Donald same group Trump. myself last week. We are providing naloxone across the country. We are providing rapid action, access Trump to treatment. We Answer. are funding safe injection sites, Mr. Speaker. That party has had no ideas except these kind of smears, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. New question. The leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. The trial of two top Liberal operatives, including the Premier's Deputy Chief of Staff, got underway last week in Sudbury. And it didn't take long for Ontarians to learn shocking new details about how far the Premier and her Liberal Party were willing to go to win the 2015 Sudbury by-election. It's alleged that the Minister of Energy demanded paid jobs for staff in exchange for running as the Liberal candidate in the by-election. Can the Premier tell us right now, did she agree Chief to this Government demand? Whip. Thank you, Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I've been very open with the legislature. I've been open with the media and with the public about uh, the allegations related to the Sudbury by-election, Mr. Speaker. Um, as the uh, leader of the third party knows, parliamentary privilege extends to all members, exempts a member from uh, the normal obligation to attend court if uh, if summoned as a witness, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I've said all along that I would be open and transparent, and that I would work with uh, with the process and. That that is exactly what I have been doing, Mr. Speaker. Therefore, I will waive my parliamentary privilege. I will appear as a witness on September 13th, Mr. Speaker. And the matter is before the courts, and we really need to let that process uh, play out, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, it appears from the evidence that the only reason the Minister of Energy himself has not been charged is because under the law it's illegal to offer a bribe but not illegal to accept one. The Minister appears to be hiding behind a legal technicality and the Premier appears to be encouraging him. In Come to order, please. Please finish. 
When will the Premier show the kind of leadership that the people of this province expect, admit that there was wrongdoing in Sudbury, and ask her minister to step down from Cabinet? Thank you. Uh, minister, the Attorney General. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. I think, uh, Speaker, the, the leader uh, of the third party and, and all members of this House very well know she should get that, uh, that this matter. Second time, Chief Government Whip. The speaker, this matter is before the courts as we speak, and it will be highly inappropriate for any one of us to engage in any conversation or speculation about uh, about uh, that case, uh, Speaker. Um, and I urge all members to respect the rules of this House, to respect the legal process, independent legal process that is uh, ongoing, uh, and refrain from asking questions uh, uh, that could have an impact on that uh, important case that is going on. Thank you very much. The member from Hamilton Mountain come to order. Thank you. Final supplementary. Inappropriate is the shenanigans that went on in Sudbury. That's what's highly inappropriate. Demanding jobs in exchange for running is a pretty serious allegation, and the Premier should take it seriously too. She should ask her Ministry of, Minister of Energy to step down from Cabinet until this trial concludes, and it can be determined by the courts whether or not the Minister was offered or accepted a bribe. Will the Premier ask her Minister of Energy to step down? Uh, speaker, again, I, I believe it's, it's worth repeating that uh, this uh, particular matter is before the courts. Uh, there is actually court, court proceeding, proceedings that are ongoing, as we all know. Uh, it will be highly inappropriate for any one of us to engage in any speculation or, or commentary on that case, and we should respect that process. And I urge all members uh, to respect uh, that process uh, as closely as possible, Speaker, uh, and move on to issues that are important to the people of Ontario and talk about issues that will improve the lives of Ontarians and build a fair Ontario. Thank you. New question, Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is to the Premier. Time and time again, the Premier told Ontarians that there was nothing wrong with what happened in Sudbury. But last week during the trial, we learned that while she was making those very assurances, she may well have known that her Minister of Energy requested paid jobs for staff in order to run for her party. Did the Premier authorize this quid pro quo in order to secure the Minister's nomination for the Ontario Legislature? Premier. Attorney General. Uh, speaker, uh, again, uh, you know, it, the, the leader of the third party knows the rules very well, and I, 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 fully, ex I fully expect that she respects the rules uh, as well. Uh, speaker, as you know very well, and you and others uh, in, in your role have clarified that when matters are before the courts, it is inappropriate uh, to ask questions about those matters, inappropriate to answer questions about those uh, matters. Speaker, in this particular instance, there is a court process that is ongoing as we speak, and it will be uh, highly inappropriate for uh, any member to engage in, in a line of questioning that could, uh, that could undermine that legal process. Um, so therefore, Speaker, I urge all members uh, to respect uh, the rules of this House uh, to respect uh, our independent judicial system yes, uh, and refrain from asking questions uh, that relates to that particular matter. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, I find it unbelievable that the Liberals are lecturing the rest of us about the respecting of rules. When it comes to the Southern Election, all we want is for the rules to be respected. The Premier's former Deputy Chief of Staff is accused of offering the Minister of Energy a bribe to run in the Sudbury by-election. That's not in uh, sync, Speaker, with the rules of the way people are supposed to behave in this legislature. We know from the testimony that the minister requested paid jobs for staff to run in the by-election. Did the premier direct Ms. Cerbera to give in to the minister's demand so that he would agree to be a liberal candidate in the by-election? Well, Speaker, what's uh, shocking and surprising is that the leader of the third party continues to play politics uh, when there's actually a legal process 
that is ongoing. I think that, Speaker, is unacceptable. This House is not the court of law. This House is not the judge and the jury. Uh, this House, uh, uh, Speaker, is there to represent the interests of the people of Ontario. This House is, is here, Speaker, to talk about things that are important to the people of Ontario. This House is not here to, to interfere in a legal proceeding that is going on. And I again urge all members, including the member of the third party, to respect the, the, the trial that is ongoing uh, as we speak in Sudbury. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, it seems the only way to get the facts out of this Premier and her Liberal Party is to drag them through court. When will this Premier stop hiding behind the trial? Order her Minister of Energy to come clean about the, his role in the actual scandal and start answering Ontarians' questions about what went on, what she knew, and when she knew it. Speaker, I will, I will repeat my answer again because I'm going to follow and respect the, the rule. Uh, that is, this matter is before the courts and it will be highly inappropriate uh, to answer any questions relating to the case that is ongoing right now in Sudbury. Thank you. Thank you. New question. The member from Sault Ste. Marie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. The Ring of Fire is one of the greatest opportunities Northern Ontario has ever seen. And yet, for 11 years since its discovery, this government has claimed that the North matters. But actions speak louder than words. All we've actually received is announcement after re-announcement, and always during an election year. But no actual progress to date. Leading up to the 2014 election, they promised us a billion dollars, but then they axed it from this year's budget. Recently, the Premier made yet another election announcement, but they've already taken the money away. And they still haven't even bothered to speak to the federal government for help. It's just more of the same old story. So, Mr. Speaker, will the Premier just admit what we already know, that these announcements are nothing more than Liberal photo ops to win over voter support in an election year? Thank you, Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, let me let me welcome the member to the legislature. It's uh, it's great to have you here. Um, but I have to say, Mr. Speaker, that um, uh, we probably need to offer you a technical briefing. Uh, yeah. the, uh, the rain of fire file, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. In fact, the billion the billion dollars done. is in place, Mr. Speaker. And in fact. We have worked with the First Nations communities, with the mining companies, Mr. Speaker, very, very closely. We're now at a place where we actually have a, a framework agreement with all of the uh, Matawa First Nations, Mr. Speaker, and we have an agreement with three of the First Nations, with Webeque, with Nibonomic, and with um, Martin Falls, Mr. Speaker, to move ahead on building community roads. That, Mr. Speaker, will mean that the infrastructure that will be paid for by that billion dollars in Which Part, at least is Answer. in the budget, Mr. Yes, Speaker, and we're moving ahead. That's a great success, Mr. Speaker, and I look forward to Thank seeing you. that infrastructure bill. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you. Again, to the Premier. I appreciate the lecture, but perhaps we can actually get a question, an answer to this next question. During these last 11 years of inaction on the Ring of Fire, this government has attributed the delay to promises that they were consulting with all of the impacted Matawa communities the right way and to ensuring that all five of those communities were on board with the development. And yet, in the Premier's recent development announcement, we learn that she has only obtained the support of three of the five communities. Oh. Neshkintega and the Yabamatong have publicly stated that they have not been properly consulted with and that they will oppose this development. How has the Premier failed to secure their support as previously promised? And how can the Premier possibly keep this year's election promise in the face of such opposition? More empty promise. More empty. More. Thank you. Peter, please. You see the please. 
Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased that the member opposite at least was told by the, his policy folks that there is an agreement with the three First Nations. Yeah. That is a huge step forward. And, Mr. Speaker, I have met with the nine. There are actually nine Matawa First Nations. I have met with them repeatedly, with the Minister of uh, Indigenous Relations, with the Minister of Northern Development and Mines. And, Mr. Speaker, it's a complex issue. There is no doubt about it. There are competing interests within the nine groups, Mr. Speaker. There are those communities are looking for slightly different things in terms of, uh, of the infrastructure build. But, Mr. Speaker, it is important for all of us in this House to know that we will continue to work with all of those First Nations. The fact that we have an agreement with three, Mr. Speaker, does not preclude that we will continue to work with the rest. We will, in fact, continue to work with all of the other Answer. six First Nations, Mr. Speaker. They know that. They've sat at the table with me. They know that we're going to work with them, Mr. Speaker, and we will find a Thank way you. to make sure that this development benefits all. Thank you. New question. Member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Premier. The government is in court on a second matter today, with former Liberal staffers facing criminal charges related to the Liberal government's politically driven billion dollar cancellation of two gas plants. The Premier rolled out a public inquiry into this matter. Then, on the same day that the public learned that the OPP had raided government offices, she shut down legislative hearings into the matter before hearing from two Liberal staffers, one of whom is in court today. The Premier has done everything she can to prevent the public from learning the truth about her party's ruthless, self-serving culture. Why is it that the only way to get the truth out of this government is to haul them into court? Question. Thank you. Premier. Attorney General. Attorney General. Well, uh, Speaker, uh, uh, perhaps uh, same advice to the member from Danforth as I gave, uh, as I was suggesting uh, to his leader, that when it comes to matters before the courts, there is a very clear rule that is outlined. Uh, in our standing orders, well established in, in all parliaments, that it is not the place of this House to discuss those matters, uh, that they are properly before an independent uh, a court, which is independent from the House uh, and the executive and the legislative branch of the, of the government. And uh, it, would be, it would be incumbent upon us to respect that, that process. So I urge the member opposite uh, to do the same. And it will be, it will be an inappropriate speaker uh, to, to speak of those issues or to speculate about uh, uh, those issues in the House. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Again, to the Premier. As a cabinet minister and campaign co-chair, the Premier went along with the gas plant cancellations that she should have known would cost over a billion dollars. Then, after becoming Premier, she had admitted this was, quote, a political decision, unquote, apologized, and then she shut down legislative hearings and told everyone to just move on. But instead of learning her lesson, the Premier doubled down and spent the next four years enacting the exact same sort of politically driven policies, from the hydro file to the transit file all to serve the Liberal Party and not the people of Ontario. When will the Premier stop abusing the trust of the people of Ontario and put the interests of the public ahead of the interests of the Liberal Party? Thank you. Attorney General. Well, the Speaker, the, the members of the third party can ask the same question any which way. Uh, the, the advice remains the same, which is this matter is before the courts and will be highly inappropriate for anybody to engage in any conversation. Uh, speaker, the, the, the appropriate place uh, for that is, 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 the, is the courts where these proceedings are taking place. Uh, so, Speaker, I will not be answering uh, any question as it relates uh, to this particular legal matter. Thank you. Give Gates a question. Thank you. A new question. The member from Kingston in the Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Education. In my riding of Kingston and the Islands, we've seen a significant investment in school infrastructure, including several new builds. Most recently, St. Francis of Assisi, which opens its, opened its doors this fall at Molly Brandt Elementary School just last year. I'd like to thank the Government of Ontario for supporting the creation of new and innovation, innovative spaces that enhance student learning. While it's important to invest in infrastructure, it's obviously critically 
important to invest in programs that nurture students. Our government is investing in new and expanded well-being programs for students across the province. Ontario is an international leader in education thanks in large part to hard-working educators and school staff. We always want to ensure that young people can reach their full potential and thrive inside and outside the classroom. Question. Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, what is Ontario government doing to improve the well-being for students across Ontario? Thank you. Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker. I want to say thank you to the member from Kingston and the Islands for this question. Promoting well-being is one of the key pillars of our government's renewed vision for education in Ontario. Last year, we travelled across the province to hear from students, from parents, guardians, and education partners about the, what well-being means to them. Exactly. We heard that student achievement is directly linked to well-being, and a safe and welcoming learning environment helps everyone succeed. Our students have said they want well-being from the front of the class to the back of the class, sure Mr. Do. Speaker. And that's why just last week, Mr. Speaker, I announced that over the next three years, we're investing $49 million wow. to focus on cognitive, social, emotional, and physical well-being for students. As we've begun this new school year, these new investments and initiatives will strengthen Answer. the well-being of all students in our school. We know that students are better able to learn when they feel safe and welcomed Thank at school. You. And have the tools to succeed. Thank you, Minister. We are extremely proud of the investments made toward our government's renewed vision for education in Ontario. I also want to thank the Minister for her advocacy and for her consultations that she's had all across the province in our schools. These investments are helping to improve and expand the well-being programs for all students. It is very important that our government continues to support well-being programs that enable young people to achieve their full potential. Minister, can you please tell us more about what school boards can achieve with the additional funding announcement announced for students' well-being? Minister. Mr. Speaker, with this new funding, we're increasing investments in the school mental health assist program from $1 million to $6 million over three years. The doubling of this program provides boards with tools and leadership and resources to support our students. Increasing our support from six to six million to twelve million dollars for local well-being priorities such as bullying prevention, peer mentorship programs, and breakfast programs to Great help news. students to thrive. By investing over six million in new supports and programs to support staff well-being okay. and violence prevention, something our education partners like OSSTF and others have asked for, we will continue to build our commitment to a work to work towards a climate of health and safety in our schools. As well, we're investing in active transportation, promoting more options for students to walk or wheel or cycle to school, cycle. and the investments are informing uh, thousands, Mr. Speaker, of students in Ontario. Thank you. No question. The member from Renfrew, Nicholson, Pembroke. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Labour. This summer, I travelled across the province for committee hearings on Bill 148. From Thunder Bay to Ottawa, Windsor to Niagara, we heard from individuals and groups expressing their concerns about this legislation. The PC party believes that the minimum wage should be raised in a responsible manner, and that includes conducting an independent ex Stop the clock. Stop the clock. Start the clock. That includes conducting an independent economic analysis so that all parties fully understand the ramifications of enacting these significant labour changes. Regrettably, the government did the wrong thing last month when they voted down our amendment yep. to require such an analysis before Bill 148 comes into force. Speaker, will the Minister of Labour correct this error and commit today to an economic impact analysis so all parties have the necessary information before these significant labour changes come into effect? Question. Thank you. Minister of Labour. Speaker, thank you very much to the honourable member for the question. Speaker, it's it's not a surprising question. It's a topic of the day, Speaker, obviously. But what I'm hearing is so disappointing. It's disappointing to the people in the province of Ontario because we know that that party has now come out and said it's against increasing the minimum wage in this province, Speaker. 
and that is simply wrong. The leader has said he's not going to support a plan that's going to help so many families across this province, Speaker. There's people out there that are working 35, 40 hours a week, more than that, Speaker, you know and they're not able to get by. We've been out, we've been consulting with these people, we heard from the same people, Speaker. We could not agree with that party any more, Speaker, than what they're saying. We don't believe anybody in this province that puts in a good day a good day's work should not be able to pay their expenses, feed their family, buy clothes for their kids, Speaker. That is so disappointing. The member from Niagara, the member from Niagara West, Ms. Glenbrook, will withdraw. withdraw. No, no, you stand up and withdraw. withdraw. Supplementary. Speaker, back to the minister. Given your and your government's about face regarding the $15 minimum wage, it is perplexing to hear the minister refusing to get all the necessary information mm. before enacting significant changes to employment standards and labour laws. As recently as January 19th of this year, the minister said this about a $15 minimum wage, and I quote, when you dig down a little deeper into the issue, though, you realize it's got ramifications that go beyond the first initial political appeal. There's actually an awful lot of economic forces at play." Close quote. Speaker, we believe the minimum wage should be raised to $15 in a responsible way. But given the fact what the minister is saying, that now completely Order. contradicts what he was saying earlier this year. What is the reason for not Question. supporting our pragmatic amendment beyond crass political calculations and trying to save the electoral fortunes Thank you. of your sinking Minister of Labour. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you again to the member for the supplementary. Speaker, you're either in favour of Bill 148 or you're opposed to Bill 148, people. Speaker, Bill 148 will change the lives of ordinary working people in the province of Ontario. Who tells us that? The opposition parties can, they can ignore the economic analysis from the Centre of uh, Economic Policy and Research, the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives. He can ignore the letter, Speaker, that came from 53 Madam, economists Madam from, across, from, from across Canada. We had a fellow with the Royal Society of Canada, two former presidents, Speaker, of the Canadian Economic Association, one who used to consult with Jim Flaherty and the Conservative Speaker. Oh, yeah. He can ignore the support of seven Nobel Prize winning economists in the United States. Speaker, we have done our homework on this. We have gone out. Answer. We know that the best thing for people in the province of Ontario is to pass Bill 148. They either support it or they oppose it. Thank you. I'm hearing today, Speaker, they oppose it. Thank you. <laughs> New question. The member from Temiskimi Cochrane. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Energy. The courts have heard testimony that the Minister of Energy demanded paid jobs for staff before he agreed to run in the Sudbury by-election for the Liberals. We want to know from the Minister, is this accurate? Minister Attorney General. Attorney General. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Speaker. I guess um, yeah, NDP uh, continues to uh, not follow the rules of this House, Speaker, and, and, and continue to ask questions uh, that are before the, 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 the court. Uh, speaker, it will be highly inappropriate for, as I said, any member uh, to answer any questions that are before the courts, um, and uh, I again urge the members opposite, especially the NDP, Stephen to Lewis, let's Lewis. focus on issues that are important to the people of Ontario, uh, like bringing uh, their hydro rates down, like increasing their minimum wage to $15 an hour and making sure that uh, people are living, uh, 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 working in fair workplaces and have good jobs in the province. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you. Speaker, again to the Minister of Energy. Just because it's not illegal to accept a bribe doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. Does the minister think it's appropriate for someone to accept a bribe just because there's no legal penalty for doing so? Attorney General. Speaker, this matter is before the courts, and uh, it will be highly inappropriate to answer any of these questions here in the House. Thank you. Thank you. New question. 
The member from Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Labour. Speaker, uh, I spent the last few months in my riding of Kitchener Centre listening to many constituents. There are many different conversations that we had, and I know that I'm not alone when I say that the one topic that was continuously raised was the plan to address inequality in the workplace. I heard this in my office, I heard this at the grocery store, I heard this at many public events that I attended. Um, I would agree with the minister in saying that people are working hard to put food on the table and to take care of their children, but they're finding that the money is just running out before the end of the month. They're working a full 35 to 40 hours a week, and still they're struggling to make ends meet. Speaker, our economy is doing well, and while businesses are expanding and creating wealth, many workers are just not feeling it. Minister, what are you doing to help these workers well, sure. and their families? Minister of Labour. Speaker, thank you, and thank you to my colleague from, uh, from Kitchener Waterloo for that important question. It's something we've all heard of, Speaker, from families around the province in our writings. It's true the uh, Ontario economy is doing very well. We're leading the G7 in economic growth. Manufacturing exports are up, and we've got the lowest unemployment rates, Speaker, since we've seen in this province since 2001. But there are families that are working 35 and 40 plus hours a week, Speaker. They're falling behind even while they're working hard, Speaker. It's not right. It needs to change. That's why we're moving ahead with the Fair Workplaces and the Better Jobs Act, Speaker, Bill 148. It's going to bring transformative change to our province's workplaces. It's going to ensure workers across this province are paid a decent wage, a living wage, Speaker, and they're treated with dignity and respect, Speaker. It's about what's doing right, yes, uh, what is right, what's fair, and what's decent, Speaker. We're building an Ontario where greater opportunity is available for everybody. Decent pay is thank available you. for everybody, Speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker, and I'd like to thank the minister for his answer. I was able to join my colleagues this summer on committee to hear feedback from Ontarians on this plan. Uh, as you know, the committee travelled to 10 different cities. We heard from almost 200 Ontarians. In Kitchener Centre, we heard from workers, business owners, labour groups, poverty reduction advocates, and many more. Speaker, it was very clear, and I hope it's clear to members on the other side of the House who sat on this committee that this legislation would have a profound impact on the lives of Ontarians, not only for people who are currently working for less than $15 an hour, but for those who aren't given any notice of their work schedule, those who can't risk taking a day off when they're sick, those who are being paid less than their full-time counterparts, and those who aren't afforded any time off to deal with difficult situations, and those who face intimidation when trying to organize. Speaker, could the minister please tell us what he is doing Doing to uh, address these specific concerns. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from uh, Kitchener Waterloo for that supplementary. It raises what I think is an incredibly important uh, point, Speaker. The legislation is not just about the minimum wage. We're putting forward a plan that's going to provide wage equality, regardless of whether you're full-time, part-time, temporary, paid sick days for the first time in the province of Ontario, Speaker, for all workers, increasing the vacation time after five years, and leaves that were asked for by, uh, by members of the opposition for survivors of domestic and sexual violence, and a more fair and transparent organization uh, process, Speaker and they want to see some more robust enforcement in the workplaces of our, uh, in the province. Speaker, after a summer of dancing around the issue and having this opinion this day and this opinion the next day, Speaker, the opposition's finally announced the that they'll be on. voting against the Speaker. That's, That's disappointing to me, Speaker, because they'll be voting against giving 30 per cent of the people in this Thank province, you. Speaker, a minimum and a living Thank you. Your question, the member from Whitby, Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker. To the Minister of Education, a recent social media post on the Ontario Autism Coalition's Facebook page showed that parents of a local school are asking for volunteers from the community to help with special needs students in the classroom. Speaker, teachers, parents and students are desperate for more resources and supports for special needs students. This minister simply has not done enough and parents are reaching out for help. When will the minister stop ignoring the pleas of teachers and students and put in place more special needs resources and supports in Ontario schools? Thank you, Minister of Education. 
Mr. Speaker, I am a bit confused by the member opposite's question, given that he is the education critic and he knows full well, Mr. Speaker, that we have increased our support for special education in this province, and we are supporting uh, young people in ensuring that they get the help and the support that they need. Mr. Speaker, I want to actually tell the member opposite how we're supporting students with special education needs. Because funding has increased to $2.86 billion, and it's a 76 percent increase since 2003. We know that every student in our province deserves the access and the supports to be successful in school, including students with special education needs. Mr. Speaker, just in the recent grants for students' needs, we have provided additional funding Answer. so that there are more caring adults in schools, 2,400 more caring adults in schools to support all of our learners, and especially students with special education Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. And back to the Minister of Education. Minister, too little, too late. Speaker, this is the state of special needs education under the minister and the Liberal government. Because of the government's scandals, waste and mismanagement over the past 14 years, they can't afford to provide students and teachers with the special needs resources they desperately need. Parents and teachers, Speaker, are working harder, paying more and getting less under this government. When will this minister finally take concrete action and support teachers and their students with special needs? Thank you, Minister. Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, as I said, uh, we've we've dramatically increased funding for special education, and we will continue to do so. Let me tell you about one program, um, and that's what we're doing for students with autism. Mr. Speaker, our government is moving forward with an unprecedented investment in autism services. In 2016, we announced a historic $500 million more to improve autism services wow. in Ontario, including $39 million for autism supports in school. And we're ver that's working George very George closely Lepreeby. with my colleague in the Ministry of Children and Youth Services as they implement Ontario's autism program to provide families with more flexibility and individualized services. Wow. This school year, school boards are receiving more than $2.86 billion, as wow. I've said, a 76% increase since 2003 in special education. We've also invested $77 million to strengthen our school's capacity to improve the learning environments for students with special education Thank needs. You. Mr. Speaker, we're supporting I'd like to remind the minister that when I stand, you sit, and it's because you're not addressing the chair that you didn't know that I was standing. New question. The, the member from Essex. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, for the second time in less than a year, Windsor and Essex County residents have been hit by debilitating floods. Residents have experienced power outages and property damage, and more than 5,000 basements were flooded. For the second time in 12 months, Windsor residents have had to rebuild and recover from this debilitating flood. The Premier tweeted that she was ready to help, but we've really seen nothing. And municipal staff continue to be spread thin, desperately trying to keep up with the amount of debris that needs to be cleared. For the health and safety of our region, the people of Windsor and Essex need action now. When will the Premier back up her tweets with action by making available all provincial resources without delay and unnecessary red tape? Thank you. Minister of Municipal Affairs. Sure, Municipal Affairs. Speaker, thank you very much. I want to thank uh, the member for the question, and, and I will begin by uh, thanking Speaker and congratulating uh, and expressing our consideration for the first responders, for the municipal officials, uh, for the volunteers who are on the ground again for the second time uh, in less than a year and doing what they can to affect uh, as best possible uh, the situation that people find themselves in through no fault of their own. What happened in Windsor, Tecumseh, Lakeshore, Amherst, uh, there, there are six municipalities that were affected. 
is again unprecedented. We understand that this is becoming more normal, unfortunately, and we need to do everything that we can to prepare ourselves as best we are able all across the province and all across the country, I would say. And I will more specifically address the member's question in the supplementary speaker, but I would say that to imply in any way, shape or form that we have not responded Answer. is incorrect, and I'll provide some of that detail in the supplementary. Thank you. Supplementary, the member from Windsor. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, we acknowledge that the minister has activated the Disaster Recovery Assistance Program, a program that has left people from last year still waiting for help. But this funding does not address the fact that municipal resources are wearing thin and staff are being stretched to their limit. Garbage trucks cannot keep up with the volume of debris and are filling up after visiting only a handful of houses. We know that the cleanup process would be expedited if this Liberal government would stop giving the city the runaround and allow garbage trucks from Michigan to cross the border in order to help. They keep passing the buck from ministry to ministry, leaving the municipalities to try and coordinate services themselves. Speaker, we know the Premier is preoccupied with her testimony for the bribery scandal, but why is she letting this scandal get in the way of assisting Question. the people of Windsor-Essex in their time of Thank need? Minister. Speaker, thanks again. Speaker, in terms of people who are still waiting for assistance from last year, Yes, from time to time when the program is activated, some people don't get the assistance as quickly as we would like. I would say most people get it very quickly. Sometimes we need receipts, we need complete applications before the support can be expedited to them. In terms of the issue related to garbage trucks, this is the first The issue related to the garbage trucks, this is the first time I've, I've heard of that speaker. I'm glad to listen to it. If the member has anything to come to me in short order. Speaker, this program was just reconstituted two years ago in consultation with AMO, the Association of Municipalities of Ontario. It had their support. It no longer, no longer requires local fundraising. And because of that significant change, the support to the people who need it can happen much quicker. Now, sometimes within weeks or months, rather than a much longer Answer. period of time. So a newly designed program. Program. It offers support to low-income people on sewage backup. It's not intended to be a replacement for Thank insurance, you. as has been suggested by some of the leaders of the opposition. New question, the member from Beaches, New York. Well, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the minister responsible for early years and child care. Now, Speaker, I'm very proud that our government is committed to ensuring families have access to quality and affordable child care in Ontario. And in my own riding of Beaches, East York, I have many new and very young families who are starting to call East Toronto home, and they need good local daycare. And I've heard from so many families that they are just, there are not enough spaces for childcare and that they can afford, and I want to ensure that we are providing childcare options for these families. And it was partially because of this shortage that I brought in my private member's bill that helped regulate daycare waitlist fees. So, Speaker. Can the minister responsible for early years and childcare tell us what this government is doing to make sure that families' needs for new, affordable, and safe daycare spaces are being properly met? Thank you, Minister responsible for early years and childcare. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the hardworking member from Beaches East York for this very important question. He is a strong advocate for his constituents on this issue. Speaker, I have heard about the challenges families across the province face when it comes to finding quality, affordable childcare, and I want to assure the member that our government is working hard, working hard every day to help Ontario families find more affordable, quality childcare options. We are taking swift strong action. And that's why in our 2017 budget, we announced an additional $200 million to transform, transform Ontario's childcare system. This investment will help 24,000 more children access quality licensed care across the province. And I'm happy to tell the member from Beaches East York that this investment in Toronto will see an additional $34.5 million going towards childcare care in the city, and that brings the total number and amount to $368 million going to the Answer. city. This will help 3,880 new licensed childcare spaces for children. Think about that. This funding thank will you. change lives. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that answer and for the tireless work that she is doing on this file. It is very much appreciated by young families across the province. 
And it's encouraging, Speaker, to know that the government is working to address the needs of Ontario families. But I recognize there's a lot of work to be done, and families are keen to see how the system will be modernized. Many parents are looking for child care options now, and we know the province has committed and announced 100,000 new spaces, but they're asking, where are these going to go? Now, in my riding of Beaches, East York, my office has worked very closely with the ministry and helped uh, facilitate new spaces in my riding, including B the Blue Bell Academy, the Kingston Road Montessori School, and also Centre 55, which has recently announced an application for 40 new spaces at Ted Reeve Arena. Now, Speaker, with the minister, please let us know how the ministry is working and to help question. all these institutions bring new child care spaces online. Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to answer the member's question, and it's a question I get asked often. In fact, last year we announced our commitment to give 100,000 more children access to licensed child care spaces over the next five years. It's a historic investment and one that will benefit all Ontarians. As part of this expansion, our government committed a massive $1.6 billion in new capital funding, which will support the creation of 45,000 new spaces in public owned buildings across Ontario. And we are well on our way. We've already received proposals for building new childcare spaces in schools, and I'm happy to report that the number of submissions has exceeded, exceeded expectations. That's amazing. That means childcare spaces will now be coming to many schools all across the province. And I am yes, pleased sir. to say there will be another round next year, and I encourage parents, families, and childcare providers to get in contact with their local service managers to see how they can get involved. Thank you. New question, the member from Nipissing. Thank you, and good morning, uh, Speaker. My question is for the Finance Minister. For years, this government has been presenting our legislature with made-up finance numbers. Whether it was from the independent experts or the government's own confidential cabinet documents received in the gas plant scandal, it's been proven that the numbers they present to the public are simply made up to fit their story. Last week, the Financial Accountability Officer provided The members will lose their props shortly and actually get warned if they do it again. You want to make an excuse? You know what I'm talking about, and you know you're not supposed to do that. Carry on. Last week, the Financial Accountability Officer provided irrefutable evidence they were using, quote, unlikely assumptions for debt reduction claims. He projects, quote, deadly dete or steady deterioration in the budget deficit over the next five years. All Question. of their made-up numbers don't come anywhere near historical numbers. It's only wishful thinking. Speaker, I would ask the minister if he can't present the province's finances with integrity. Thank you. Minister of Finance. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, well, let me begin by thanking the Financial Accountability Office for the work he does and their, uh, their department, recognizing their sensitivity analysis that they provide, which we recognize. And every year, similar accusations are made by the member opposite. And, and Mr. Speaker, every year we exceed our targets. Every year we exceed our targets, and public accounts reaffirms that. We beat our deficit by $3.3 billion this year, Mr. Speaker. We are, the, we are the leading jurisdiction in North America when it comes to economic growth. Our unemployment rate is at 5.7 percent, Mr. Speaker, and we're on track to balance the budget as we said we would this year, next year, and the year after that. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Back to the finance minister. As if the blistering commentary from the FAO wasn't enough, the Auditor General has now weighed in. She said this government's annual deficit is understated, net debt is understated, and accumulated debt is understated. And we're not talking nickels and dimes here, Speaker. Billion. The Auditor says our deficit is $1.5 billion more and our net debt is $12.5 billion more than reported. So for the second year in a row, the auditor has said, quote, based on the evidence, the statements are significantly misstated. Both of the legislative officers have told us this government's numbers can't be trusted. Speaker, I ask the minister, why does it always take the financial accountability officer, the auditor general, or the OPP to get to the truth in Ontario? Sure, Mr. Speaker, investors around the world are investing in Ontario for a reason. 
They recognize that Ontario's economy is growing. They're recognizing our fiscal responsible approach to growing the economy. Investing in things that matter are working. And our plan is working. We're borrowing $30 billion less than we had anticipated. Our debt to GDP is lower now than it was anticipated, and it's tracking to go further down. And, Mr. Speaker, as we produce and as we move forward, we're taking every necessary step to grow the economy. And as we grow the economy, it enables us to source more opportunity to invest in the things that matter to Ontarians, things that that member and his party opposite have voted against. They voted against providing uh, more free tuition for our students. They voted against the very nature of trying to provide extended pharmacare for every young person under 25. These are the reasons we're able to do that, because we balance the budget, yes, we're taking the steps necessary to invest in infrastructure that makes us competitive and enables Thank us you. to balance the books all the while. Thank you, Mr. My Speaker. For the Premier. Uh, Speaker, I spend the weekend at community events in and around Sudbury and Nickel Belt and everywhere I went, people were lining up to talk to me about the bribery trial. The good people of Sudbury are ashamed of the three-ring circus that the Premier has created in our hometown with the bribery scandal. The Premier needs to stop hiding behind legal technicality, take responsibilities for her action and the action of her staff and party members. What will it take for the Premier to realize that the longer she hides behind technicality, the less the people of Sudbury and the people all over Ontario, for that matter, can trust her and her Liberal government. Thank you, Premier. Attorney General. I uh, speak of this matter is before the courts and will be inappropriate to answer any questions relating to this matter. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, time and back to the Premier. Time and time again, the Premier has said. There is nothing wrong, nothing wrong went on in Sudbury, that it was all business as usual. But it was not, Speaker. It took only a day of testimonies in the bribery trial to find out more shocking information about the length of which the Premier was willing to go to win back Sudbury. Speaker, can she not see the damages that she is doing to all of us? The damages she's doing to our democratic institution, the damages she's doing to the Legislative Assembly and the processes that goes on in here. Does the Premier think that the people of Ontario Order. deserve to learn the truth from her, learn the truth from their Premier? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Speaker, the people of Sudbury very much know that this matter is before the courts, and uh, people of Sudbury very much respect the judicial process and the independence of that of that process. It would be highly inappropriate, Speaker, for anyone in this house to speak uh, to these issues, given she that that, 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 that court that. case is ongoing as we speak. Thank you. Thank you. New question: The member from Mississauga, Brampton South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. This summer, I have been in my great riding of Mississauga Brampton South, talking to my constituents about what matters most to them. One of the top topics in these conversations was health care, specifically pharmacare. Our government believes that having access to necessary prescription medications is critically important in this province. That is why I'm proud that our government has taken a major leap towards establishing a provincial pharmacare program for children and youth. Can the Minister for Health Care and Long Term please inform this House of the historic investments our government is making in Ontario's children and youth? Thank you. Minister of Health Long Term Care. Well, Mr. Speaker, unlike the member from Nickel Belt, the lines of people waiting to see me across the province are, quite frankly, families and individuals, young people, who want to ask me about OHIP Plus, our yeah. pharmacare program that we're rolling out on January 1st. And I want to tell everybody that we are on track, we'll be on time, and it's remarkable access for every Ontarian with a health number, with an OHIP number, to more than 4,400 medications. Absolutely. Member from Hamilton East, Stony Creek, come to order. 
Finish, please. More than 4,400 medications absolutely free of charge, no co-payment, no annual deductible, no upfront co cost. Mr. Speaker, that will be for asthma drugs. It will be for drugs to treat epilepsy. It will be drugs to treat HIV, rare diseases, Allergies, cancer, skin conditions, <laughs> ear infections, the works. We're all very proud on this side of the legislature, Mr. Speaker, for a program that's going to have a dramatic effect for 4 million Ontarians beginning January 1st. Here, here. Member from Bruce Gray, uh, Sound, and a point of order. Thank you for your bill. The Speaker can always do other things just because the question period is over doesn't mean he doesn't have his authority anymore. And I'll use it. <laughs> Member from here, uh, Bruce Gray, Owen Sound, on a point of order. Thank you very much. Of the legislature to join us immediately following question period for a photo on the staircase to help raise awareness for childhood cancer. Uh, we'll be joined by advocates, families, and doctors. And I want to do a special shout out to Neil Rourke for his leadership on this very important cause. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. I had Kingston in the islands from rotation. King Kingston in the islands. Sorry, Premier. Point of order. Okay, yeah, Mr. Speaker, I want to correct my record. Um, in a, uh, an answer to the a question from the uh, member for Sault Ste. Marie, Mr. Speaker, I indicated that there were three uh, First Nations that uh, were working with the, uh, the government on uh, the Ring of Fire. In fact, uh, I neglected to say that late last week, Ireland, another First Nation, actually indicated that they are interested in working with yeah. us. So they're full. Thank you. Thank The member from Stormont now ask from Gary for point of order. Thank you, Speaker. Point of order. I want to welcome Mike Corgan today to the legislature. He's former Deputy Minister of uh, Finance in Ottawa, and he's the, with the Ontario Brain Institute. Thank you, Kingston and Riley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to welcome to the legislature my executive assistant, Jacqueline Hamill, as well as Anna Majedic, who is uh, my new LA and also a graduate of the MBA program at Queen's University. Welcome to Queen's Park. Uh, two, two quick points as reminders. Uh, I, I know it's hard not to do, but uh, we put five minutes on the clock for introductions. I try to cover all of the introductions, and if you know they're coming in later, just introduce them during that time period and let people know that they're going to be joining us later in the day. Uh, and the second thing is, uh, when you correct a record, it has to be, there's a minutiae here. It wasn't a correction of the record, actually, it was an addition to, so we have to uh, leave it at that. Uh, that, well, yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> This, uh, I, <laughs> no, I don't think she knows better. <laughs> Therefore, question period is over. This house stands recess until 1 p.m. this afternoon.